today. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Amy Kirsten. I'm a volunteer with the Social Action Office in uh, Davenport at the Diocese of Davenport. Um, Tony Forlini is our technical guru, and he is making sure that there is a recording of this meeting or this session and then putting it up on the diocesan YouTube channel, which is awesome. Um, I do want to remind everybody that since we are recording for playback, we really appreciate it if you're able to mute yourselves. It cuts down on the background noise. Um, and with that, oh, I guess I want to also say, um, if when we have questions and comments, if you are more comfortable sending those through chat, please do. Um, we'll try to get to as many of those as we possibly can. Um, so we're going to start with prayer and Kent Ferris, who is my boss and director of the social action office has agreed to lead us. Thanks, Amy. The uh, prayer or reflection that I will share actually comes by way of the trip that we'll talk about. And uh, may very well be the case that Sister Betty Campbell is referenced in Reflections. It was actually a reflection that Sister Betty shared with me. The note from uh, Sister Betty in Ciudad Juarez, uh, you asked me for the definition of solidarity. I remember what Bishop Leonidas Proano said about solidarity. He was Bishop of Riobamba in Ecuador died at 78 in 1988. He was known as the Bishop of the Indigenous. Beloved Father Peter, Peter Hind, who worked for decades with Sister Betty, and I stayed with him three times on our trips in Latin America. So the reflection is titled Solidarity. To always maintain attentive ears, to hear the cry of pain of others, and their request for help is solidarity. To always maintain an alert gaze and eyes spread out over the sea, looking for some shipwrecked person in danger is solidarity. To feel the suffering of your brother and sister as your own and to make the anguish of the poor your own is solidarity. To be the voice of the humble, to discover injustice and evil, to denounce the unjust and the evildoer is solidarity. To let yourself be carried away by a message full of hope, love, and peace, including shaking a brother's and sister's hand is solidarity. To become yourself the messenger of a sincere and fraternal embrace that one people sends to another is solidarity to share the dangers in the struggle, to live in justice and liberty, risking even love, risking in love, even your life is solidarity. To be devoted to love is the greatest proof of friendship. To live and die with Jesus Christ is solidarity. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kent, so much. As Ken alluded to in, in um, introducing the prayer, we're here to hear about an immersion experience um, that several of our diocesan members participated in at the border. Um, Bishop Zinkula and five deacon candidates, um, the deacon faith formation director and the editor of the Catholic Messenger made that trip last month. Um, many of them are able to be here today we do have a few who were unable to join us, but they did record messages to kind of give us their sense, their, what, what they remembered and what spoke to them during the trip. And I'm going to start off with um, the message from Bishop Zinkula. So. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry, I can't be with you. Um in person or you know virtually in person anyway um so this recorded video will have to do i was asked to say uh, a few words about my experience my takeaways from our um, border immersion experience and um so uh, two things kind of uh i'll focus on in in, in um you know in these reflections one is with regard to the 
The um, refugees and migrants themselves, um, my experience of people on the margins, and this is, again, the same experience again, it's always, there's always a, a kind of a, a, a joy there that maybe we don't have as much, um, those of us who aren't struggling in that particular way. And, you know, um, we have things and, and our, our, our lives aren't so difficult and we can become sort of um, lackadaisical about that, but there's um, there's a jo there's a joy that that I don't want to romanticize poverty and, and, and difficulties, but there's a deeper kind of a, a sense of joy that I always find um, in those situations, and um, and there's a greater sense of community. <clears throat> and I'm generalizing like crazy here, of course, but but um, people need each other. They need to uh, they need help just to get through life, the challenges that they're facing. And so I always sense that, and I sense that, that at the border as well. In fact, we were told that that, um, that area, El Paso, Juarez, Ciudad Juarez, and, um, and there, geographically it's a natural passageway. And so like back in the time, indigenous folks um, moving around and, and, uh, and, and traveling and uh, Spanish and, and, and now as well, you know, going from Mexico City to Colorado or Santa Fe. And, and they were telling us that, you know, like in El Paso, um, people just for generations, you know, they've, they've just helped each other along as people move through. It's kind of like the Holy Land. You know, that was a kind of a natural um, passageway. That, and Jesus experienced um, that whole thing uh, during his life. So, that, so there was this joy and there's um, <clears throat> community <clears throat> and also... Uh, you know, and again, I'm generalizing a, a lot, but kind of a deeper faith and hope, maybe that um, that we, then we have, you know, those of us who are better off. So that's 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 one thing. The other thing that um, really s stands out for me is um, the people basically doing ministry down there. We talked to a lot of different individuals and, and heard about a lot of different groups, and I won't go into detail. The, the, um, guys that um, in um, diaconate formation can give you examples of this, um, but really powerful um, stories and uh, that we heard about their, their work, their ministry. Um, and they were, you know, so passionate about, about what they were doing and, and uh, um, they're committed. Sometimes some of them for decades and decades they've been doing work there and, and a joy with them too, even though it's not always some um, they're not only successful, right? Uh, but they, we heard a lot about just um, listening to people um, over and over. People mentioned that and, and walking with people, just being there for people. You might not be able to fix everything like we want to, but um, just being there with them, that's like really, really important. Like it was um, in my prayer today, I was reading um, some um, from Mother Teresa, some of things that she has said. And here's one thing that kind of uh, um, jumped out at me. She said, if you love, you cannot fail. The success of love is in the loving. It is not in the result of loving. Of course, it is natural in love to want the best for the other person. But whether it turns out that way or not does not determine the value of what we have done. We have loved, and that is a beautiful thing. Because when we love, we allow God to shine through us. So people like that, you know, um, are inspirational to me. People doing that kind of ministry um, with the poor and people on the margins. Um, and, and they're my heroes. And I want to be like them. They really are role models for me. So have a good lunch and learn. It's been nice being with you, um, even though it's in, you know, it's in a recorded video. So take care, everybody. Um, I loved what, what Bishop had to say about, um, the effort to love, putting the love in, that's enough, that success or fail, that that's, that's what we need to do. I think that's very profound. Um, and not surprising then the source it came from, um, Bishop and the five deacon candidates, uh, went to the border and, um, I have video messages from a couple more. 
but we have several people here today who actually were there and lived the experience. And um, we wanna give them an opportunity to um, tell us what they saw, how they felt. Um, and I'm gonna give you their names, but then I'm gonna ask each of them as they join the conversation, if you would reintroduce yourself so that people can easily put the, the face and the name together. Um, so Kent Ferris is here. He is Director of Social Action at the Diocese. Um, Gary Johnson and Ryan Chet are Deacon Candidates. And Barb Arlen Fye is the editor of the Catholic Messenger. So um, Kent, I'm gonna toss it to you to kick us off and everybody should feel free then to join in with their experiences. Again, as Amy mentioned, uh, Kent with the Social Action Office, but I'm also a parishioner at Saints Mary and Matthias in Muscatine. What I wanted to share came by way of the first day that we were there. The, the first night in El Paso, after speaking with and having uh, dinner with Bishop Seitz, again, a, a profound conversation, uh, no doubt, we then had a chance to hear from Maria Torres. I think it was a matter of me getting my bearings about me. I could hear what she was saying. I took lots of notes, but it was only upon preparing for today's lunch and learn that the sheer enormity of what she shared hit me. Maria is a volunteer psychologist, clinical anthropologist with the Jesuit Relief Service. She's originally from Guatemala, now has lived in El Paso for several years. She shared she has an interdisciplinary health doctorate degree, and some of her studies have been supported by a Fulbright scholarship. She said she pursued additional education to more fully understand indigenous people. What she found was that Western culture psychology focuses heavily on pathology. But she had a sense, and it played out by further study and now the field work that she does, that indigenous people are very resilient. Resilience and well-being are what JRS focuses on by way of their, their binational program, both in the US and in Mexico. She spoke of how each week there are 300 immigrants that are expelled through El Paso back to Ciudad Juarez. Some are able to find safe and appropriate shelter. Many though have no choice but to move into safety houses where immigrants are kept and, and extorted. She spoke of how traveling into Ciudad Juarez via Uber to meet immigrants is a very scary matter. She said, I got to the shelters because there is a need that JRS can help meet addressing mental health and psychological needs and also assisting in securing legal services. She added that JRS can also help those who want to stay in Mexico and have regular status there to be able to begin work. Maria also spoke of the accompaniment that happens if and when immigrants are allowed into the United States in El Paso, helping with matters like basic health, more legal assistance, getting kids in school, housing, she shared a couple of comments that mean more as time has passed, speaking to the profound concept of resiliency that she spoke of. Maria shared these thoughts about what she has learned, what keeps her doing the work. A lot of folks who have gone through a lot are also very holy. Their experiences were learning and growing in their faith. Amidst harsh realities like how some young children in their home countries, as young as eight, are forced to learn to use automatic weapons. She says she hears expressions of resiliency like the immigrant who said, I pray and I pray and I pray until I feel better. They, tr they try and they trust. And they're, and they're doing their part. What an incredible soul Maria is. What holy work she undertakes. And I will let whoever goes next.
I'll jump in, Kent. Um, I'm Ryan Burchett and uh, Deacon Candidate at St. Paul the Apostle in Davenport. And um, I didn't prepare anything, so I apologize, Kent. You you went up to me again. But uh, <laughs> uh, I think just a little bit of context, I you know, as I'm running into people who knew that I went on this trip, they're like, so what were you guys doing down there? It, it, this was not a service trip. This was not, you know, let's go build some houses in Juarez or anything like that. It was unique in that we accompanied a bishop for starters. So we had access to Bishop Mark Seitz, which if you do not know that name, please go meet this guy just to do a quick Google search and find out some of the tremendous witness that he's doing at the border. Um, and we met with the Bishop of Juarez uh, and uh, hear about how they're managing through this true humanitarian crisis that's going on at the border. It's very difficult not to talk about this stuff and end up having it decline into a political conversation when you're back talking with people in Iowa. My only comment to that effect is that this is not a blue or red issue. Uh, Bill Clinton built walls, George Bush built walls, Obama built walls, Trump built walls. Um, this is a humanitarian crisis that has resulted from our American uh, insatiable thirst for cheap goods, cheap labor, and it is in our country's interest to keep third world countries third world in order for that need to be met, for our need for drugs, for our need for cheap electronics, for our need for cheap car parts. So that's the end of my political uh, you know, soapbox, but it's the truth. And we are, uh, we are violating international laws that we put into place at World War II so that this would never happen again, that somebody couldn't fear so much for their life in their own country that they couldn't get help. And, and we are, uh, we are grossly um, refusing that right to people who desperately need it. We went down there to see it up close and personal. And it's so hard not to see it through the lens of your own experience. Like when we visited a school um, for uh, handicapped kids, um, we met some nuns who said, you know, the reason we're doing this is because we saw these handicapped kids and they were, um, they needed help. And so it was the first thing in front of our face. And so we addressed that. And then it, we found out that there were more. And that's how they, every single person that we talked to, and Bishop touched on this, um, said they were handling the situation was that this problem is so huge, we can't solve it. So let's solve the problem that's right here in our face. And uh, I saw in those little kids that the, they needed medical help. They didn't think, I have a daughter who had open heart surgery a couple of years ago, but I had every opportunity for the greatest healthcare in the world in Iowa City. I had insurance. I had the ability to take time off of work and see that every need that she had was met. And to see in the faces of these children, um, the face of my own daughter, um, and to help me realize how fortunate I am was a paradigm shift for me. I mean, you know it. But until you see it, you don't know it. And one of the things that uh, my elevator pitch, when people do ask me the question, I'm like, you don't have enough time to talk about this. But I say, number one, it's a horrible situation down there and, and, it, and it's unnecessary. Number two, there's amazing people doing incredible things and, uh, and we can do that too. And the, one of the things that stuck with me was Bishop Seitz when he visited us, he said, every diocese is a border diocese. You have immigrants in your community. You have migrants in your community. You don't have to solve their problems, but you can accompany them. And we have every opportunity here in the Quad Cities to accompany those people who are at the margins to face their needs for that moment or that minute or that hour or that week or that year that we have the privilege to accompany them. We have that ability if we step outside of our comfort zone a little bit not to take Christ to that person, but to meet Christ in that person. And I think that's the challenge that we have to open our eyes up to and that we, frankly, most everyone who <laughs> is, sits in our pews is among the one percenters of the world. We have resources to share, whether even if it's just our time, and those opportunities are here in our community. And I encourage everyone to... Uh, to take a chance to stick their neck out a little bit and look for them.
Thank you, Ryan. Um, wow. Wow. Um, it, it can feel very overwhelming at times when you look at the different situations we're facing. And so to hear just that very simple perspective of looking right in front of you and seeing what's right in front of you and working to, on, on that issue or solving that issue, that's really, um, really good advice. And I had never considered the, um, the thought that we're not here to take Christ to people. We're here to see Christ in people. That's going to change the way I approach some of the things I'm doing. So I appreciate those thoughts. Um, I'm going to just take a moment. Um, I, Barb and Gary, I know that you're still there and I want to hear from you, but I'm going to um, play one, on another video from one of the deacon or deacon candidates who's not able to join us. Um, and which one am I playing? Oh, I'm going to start with um, Deacon Andy Hartigan. So. And De Deacon ha Andy Hartigan is from the, uh, what is this? <laughs> it's, it's, it's legit candid. It's the beginning of the video. I couldn't, okay. couldn't yeah, keep yeah. you out of it with, and not cut off some of what he said. So. The, the, the thing I will add though, is Deacon Andy Hart, Deacon candidate, Andy Hardig, and I don't want to ordain him uh, prematurely, is a, a parishioner at uh, uh, Prince of Peace, Christ, uh, Jesus Christ, Prince of Peace in Clinton. Okay. Well, hi, I'm Andy Hardigan. I'm from the from Prince of Peace Parish in Clinton, Iowa. And I'm a little reflection about our immersion experience in El Paso and personal reflection. You know, I, I kind of take away from there as, you know, as we're called to in our baptism to be a pilgrim people. And as we went down to El Paso, we got to experience um, a lot of different individuals. Um, I, I like looking into there and being invited into many, many sacred spaces um, you know, sacred spaces of, you know, bishops doing a lot of hard work for the, for the immigrants. Um, a lot of in, the actual immigrants themselves that shared um, their experience with, with us. Um, one experience that I really uh, walked away, you know, pretty moved, moved with was that with Sister Carol and a, a home for some disabled, some disabled children. You know, we went in there, this was a, a relatively poor neighborhood and you know, scraping by, trying to raise money, just take care of this di disabled kids and uh, walk in there and there we spent time with them, but we were able to share a meal with them. Here's a group with barely scraping by on anything and they, are, they put together a meal for us, something we could afford, but they, out of the kindness of their heart, provided a meal for us. And that sharing of that meal with our fellow brothers and sisters, regardless of where um, we originate, where we come from, takes me back to almost the, you know, the last supper and sharing the meals with my families over the years. This was an extension of my, you know, family and just the pure graciousness um, that was shown by that, that group there really, really stood out to me. Um, and the second, big experiences that stood out for me. There was a lot of them, no doubt about it, but was kind of bringing it back to the, the, the border mass we had and, you know, celebrating with our you know, fellow immigrants, people in Juarez, um, you know, bringing this home to a Eucharist, the, 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 the uh, Eucharist, the mass of unity, um, where you watched these many, many young children carrying these white crosses up to the, the different bishops and receiving them and it was a communal celebration of, you know, what we all should be experiencing, the joy of the Gospels. And there we all were together as people before the Eucharist, celebrating with Christ. And it was a great conclusion to the week, kind of wrapping it up. And uh, so those are two experiences. Um, um, there were many, many more, but I'm going to kind of keep it that one. And um, I, I hope, hopefully the, the people listening to this will um, understand what I, you know, a little bit about what we, what we experienced, but I, I thank you for your time. And I also thank you for listening. Okay. Um, Barb or Gary, anything that you would like to share about your impressions from that visit? Um, I guess I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, 
they both touched on the visit to the school and that touched me deeply, partly because of the work they're doing, but partly because my wife taught special education, early childhood special education for 33 years. And I just saw um, the same, the love that my wife gave to her kids and it, and it reflected back from the kids. I saw that same thing at this school. And uh, it, it shows the importance of, of meeting people, being with people. Um, it makes, like we talk about, we use terms like immigrants and, and uh, terms like that, but we're talking about people. And so um, through my deacon formation um, and through this immersion experience, I, I find over and over that I'm, I'm meeting new people through this experience and my life is enriched by that. And uh, definitely um, meeting the different people. Some are, uh, well, I think most of them were either religious sisters or lay ministers. Um, we met uh, Heidi Cernica, who is a, a lawyer, but she's a lay minister, lay Mary Noel minister. And she's been in El Paso for three years um, as a legal representative for persons that are seeking asylum. And she explained a lot about that process. And uh, it, it's daunting to hear about their lived experience from where they come from, the experience of traveling, um, the experience of, of trying to get to the country to seek asylum. Um, and then the whole journey through the asylum process, I think she mentioned it, it can take two to three years uh, for a person to go through that process. But, but it was exciting to her. It, 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 you know, you could see the spirit working within her through her work, through what she's, through trying to help others. And I think that's a big takeaway that, that I, to, I can bring back here. Um, we have, well, as it was mentioned, um, every, every diocese is a, is a border diocese, but it's also every diocese, there are opportunities to serve people in need of some kind. And yes, it can be intimidating to step out to, um, you know, I, last spring, I spent time at a homeless shelter visiting with uh, men at this homeless shelter. And I was very intimidated going in, but I found it there again. If we look at each person as an individual, listen to their story, um, I can't solve all of their problems, but uh, as Bishop said, to, to offer ourselves to just be with them, hear what they want, hear what they want to say, listen to them speak. That was mentioned. Uh, um, it's important that we recognize the other. Um, they want to be heard. They want to be recognized as a person and we can offer that. And that's just the start of how we can assist in some way, but our lives will be enriched if we step out, move out of our comfort zone and uh, move in that direction. Mark, would you care to share any of your experience? Sure. Um, I really appreciate what everyone had to say. And one of the things I wanted to um, just express was the idea of being able to accompany these deacon candidates and the bishop and deacon Frank was absolutely amazing for me because I was there to cover this story, but I was every bit as, as immersed in this experience as, as, as the um, deacon candidates and the bishop and um, deacon Agnoli. And that for me was sacred. I mean, and to be able to to sit in with them on their morning prayer and evening prayer as they reflected on the day and you know their hopes and dreams and what they've experienced, those were holy moments for me. The other thing that struck me was how personal it was. You do have to meet people. It, it, that's where the love comes from. That's where Mother Teresa grew that love. 
that that school experience, the school for the children with disabilities struck me because we saw children and we were told some of these children could not even move. There's a little boy in a wheelchair and he couldn't even lift up his head at that, the time when they had this child. And they worked miracles through love. I don't even know what they did. I don't know how they managed, but this child was holding a book in his hand and turning pages. And it's just like, I'm a mom of a child with a disability. And so I could see that the thing that struck me that, that these nuns had to say was, when a mother in, a, in an impoverished community like this has, has a child with a disability, it's so much more difficult because they don't have the resources to take care of that child. And they feel a sense of shame that they had a child with a disability. And these nuns not only help these ch children to do things no one ever dreamed that they would be able to do, they give the mother's dignity. They give the children and the mother's dignity. And that just, for me, for a mom who has been there with those moms, I was an impoverished mom with a child disability, but I certainly felt what those moms must have felt like. And to, to, to see what those nuns have done with the women and how committed they are was just, it just, just melted my heart. And, and then the experience with Betty, Betty, um, sister Betty at Ciudad Juarez, when she had us, she had, a, she had this outdoor grotto. I don't know what you call it exactly. It's a wall and it has all these names, different uh, different sections of names of people who have been killed um, for just, you know, priests, uh, lay people, you name it, um, just killed for whatever reason. And she had us each pick um, strips of paper with names of, of, of people who had been killed. And, and it had the name of the person and the age and their date of death. And so she had us all come in a circle after we'd written the names on the walls and we all got together in a circle and prayed. And we said, each one of us got to say the names of the people's people we were holding the list of the name. And that for me was, um, I, it, 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 I felt like this is a real person. This was someone who now, I now have a claim to their soul. I mean, I, I, it just feels like that's the communion of saints. And I, I was just struck by the idea and saddened to think that my person, the name I was reading, had died and had died at age 19 or 21, had a long life ahead. And it, it just, that, that just really struck me. And the work that she's done for so, so very many, many years, decades, and she lives a very Spartan existence in a little home. She sleeps on a cot, like a, you know, a collapsible cot when she could sleep in a bed, she's got beds, that's for guests. And I, I just, just, just a life of simplicity and a commitment to walking with people, accompanying with people, accompanying people. And that's what we saw um, everywhere. I guess I was struck too, when we went to um, that restaurant, uh, oh, it was called, um, I forgot the name of the restaurant, um, Maya. Um, Cafe Marapan. Marapan. And I was struck when we met um, Lorena Andrade, the director of La Mujer Obrara, which um, started up that restaurant and a whole bunch of other things. They work with women, they empower women. This has been a ministry for, uh, you know, a social justice effort for since 1978 or 1980, something like that. And they work to help women, to help, you know, empower women, to help women have a voice in the workplace, in schools, they and they continue to advocate for um, just school systems and for just labor laws, everything. And I guess that's what th these personal encounters, we got to meet real people, you know, you know, people living on the border, people living on the margins, and the people working with these people. And for me, that was so personal and so how could you not love these people how could you not advocate for them after you have seen what they've experienced and that's that that to me was very sacred if i can amy i want to um uh 
thank Barb for being on the call <laughs> or the Zoom call. Uh, for those that may not be within the diocese, what we can also do is share links uh, by way of articles that, that Barb has written for the Catholic Messenger uh, describing facets of this trip. And um, any opportunity that we have for folks to be able to understand the efforts that the bishop is undertaking and, and how uh, we can be part of the, the greater uh, responsibility to care for brother and sister is, is, is always a good thing. And to be able to have a professional journalist accompany us, it took a huge, uh, it was a, a huge relief to be able to experience it. But I knew that Barb being able to come with us would be powerful too. Before you go to what may be the last recording, Amy, if I can for just a second, uh, when we talked about this trip, uh, our hosts were Project Encuentro in El Paso, and that's what they do. They, they provide folks uh, up to a week period of time, seven, five to seven days, where it's, an, it's a border immersion experience. And oftentimes what they do is allow folks to also do some local volunteering during that period of time. Because our trip was shorter, because it was aimed primarily at mass at the border at the end of the trip, and because we were also meeting with bishops that other groups may not have, we didn't have the same exact experience, but we were very intentional about the groups that we met with. For me, I had been there two years before. I knew some of these folks. And so uh, Father Raphael, Brother Todd, uh, Debbie at Project Encuentro were accommodating to our schedules. Barb mentioned the visit at La Mujer Abuera, and she's chronicled it in a messenger article. There was one other group that I want to make reference today. Both um, La Mujer Abuera and the Hope Border Institute are involved in work at the borders. Then the Hope Border Institute brings the perspective of Catholic social teaching to bear on the realities unique to the US-Mexico border region they say that through a robust program of research and policy work, leadership, development, and action, that they help build justice and deeper solidarity across the borderlands. I, I knew the founding executive director of Hope Border Institute, having done this type of work for a number of years, but uh, we had the opportunity to meet with uh, Mr. Dylan Corbett, um, who not only has responsibilities for the Hope Border Institute, but he's also the assistant regional coordinator on the Migrants and Refugees Committee that's part of the Dicastery of Integral Human Development at the Vatican. So as far as lay people working in the United States, he has a very close connection with the types of efforts in supporting immigrants and refugees that Pope Francis wants the global church to do. We were very, very fortunate to have an evening meal with and then listen to Dylan talk about the undertakings that they have. And again, those two entities are both Catholic Campaign for Human Development funded programs. And so what I wanted to make sure was that my, my classmates, my fellow deacon candidates had an opportunity to see firsthand what the strength of that campaign looks like in order to assist me in promoting the collection every November from here on, because they saw it. They could understand how it was empowering people. And the thing that Dylan said that struck me was, he said, again, he also talked about every diocese is a border diocese, but he said, when you are undertaking these efforts, bring it back to the person. He repeated that five times. So it is about encuentro or encounter in order that you can be transformed. And in the ways that Ryan's talking about, see Christ in the other person. And also, as Ryan alluded to, begin to address the root causes as to what's going on. Immediate need, addressing root causes, two feet, you've seen it before. Yes, it's, it's uh, something that we stand with. We, we stand with those who are attempting to advocate for themselves. Um, and so that, in addition to many other folks, and I think Barb may be writing about Sister Betty at some point in the future, 
Um, stay tuned and I'm going to stop talking and turn it back to Amy so she can hear from one more of our, our uh, travelers. Thanks, Kent. Um, I just wanted to say really quickly before I play the next video that it was it was so um, interesting to me that both um, Gary and Barb, not only did you see Christ in the other person, but you saw people and relationships that mattered to you in the other people. Gary, you saw someone who was doing what your wife has done. And Barb, you saw the relationship that you have with your son. Um, and I believe that those connections too are what really compel us to want to do more for mm -hmm. others. Um, so I'm going to play um, the video from Andrew Reef next. As soon as I find it. So I'm Andrew Reif. I'm from St. Mary's Parish in Dodgeville. Um, as I uh, came back from this trip, and I'm, I'm still unpacking this trip, um, just the conversations ha I've had with people already, uh, reactions I've gotten from people saying uh, where I was. You know, you, you tell people you're going to uh, Texas and Mexico and they go, oh, wow, you know, I'll bring back a souvenir or, uh, you know, why aren't you tanner than this? You know, uh, they think you're on vacation. And even just this past week after Thanksgiving, uh, talking to my brother-in-law about this trip saying, well, we were in El Paso and, and Juarez and, and he just stopped in his tracks and said, you know how dangerous it is down there? I said, yeah, I do. And, um, you know, we, we certainly uh, weren't in any great, um, great places of influence as far as money goes. You know, when, if you simply Wikipedia Juarez, it shows you the highlights of the town. Um, and that was certainly not on our uh, travel map when we were down there. And the reason that I, I chose to uh, accompany these fine gentlemen and, and Barb is that I needed to see this for myself. Um, I'm from, well, Dodgeville, Sperry, Minneapolis. We're talking really small towns. And to be honest, I'm not much of a world traveler. And so, you know, uh, you get all your learning from the books and the media and you name it and you're, you're not getting all the information necessarily, right? So um, I, I really just needed to experience this for myself. Uh, what is going on at the border? And um, from the get-go, you know, as soon as, as we woke up, uh, what, Wednesday morning and we're uh, arriving in uh, Las Cruces and then in El Paso, um, it's kind of that moment of uh, we're not in Kansas anymore. And I certainly, oh, some lights just turned on, sorry. <laughs> um, I certainly had that, that moment of, wow, I definitely am somewhere else. Even though I'm, I'm still in the United States, this is uh, a very different um, culture down here. And, and the experience, uh, I've shared this before with these, these folks, of being the minority, uh, that's that's pretty new for me. Um, being in an area where I am, um, I I don't look like everybody else around there. Um, but I would say, uh, seeing and listening to um, all the different folks that we were introduced to um, at the Encuentro project there in El Paso, um, getting to meet with. Yeah, Bishop Seitz and uh, the Bishop of, of Juarez. Um, it, it opened my eyes to the fact that, uh, like Bishop Seitz said, um, you know, someone asked, you know, how, how can you do this? How, how are you doing all this work? And, and the fact that, because that's what we're called to. And, and maybe it is easier for, for him down in, in El Paso to see, to see the work that, Christ is calling us all to in those moments because I've never seen a homeless person on the street corner in Sperry, Iowa. I've never seen, um, 
I, I've never heard of a murder in, in my small town. Um, and hearing the testimony of so many different people of uh, what life is like and, and the hardships that these people face, it is something that as I witnessed it, it's my duty to bring back to my community to say, listen, you, you don't have to take everything I take for gospel here, but uh, there definitely is more going on at the, um, at the border between the U.S. and Mexico than maybe we want to, uh, or maybe that we, there's more there than we feel comfortable admitting. Um, and, and it's our job to to spread the word that um, there are people in need and there are, uh, it's our duty as Christians to, to accompany those people and, and to bring back that message of hope that, you know, there is something better for, for everyone. And even just in our own context down here or, uh, you know, up here in, in, uh, you know, in, the, in Iowa. Thank you both. <laughs> okay. Um, so what I'll be doing um, after this is apologizing to Andrew for getting his last name wrong, despite listening to his video multiple times. Um, his his thoughts when, when I was listening to them today brought to mind the, that question, which can't you always bring up in, in our meetings and when we're together in the social action office talking and that's this idea of what, so what, now what? So having listened to you all talk about what you saw, um, what will change for you having had this experience? For, for me, um, I'm, I'm like doubly, triply blessed because this is my ministry. This is what I've done as a diocesan staff member for 12 years. And in 2010, I was afforded the opportunity to travel to Tanzania and Ethiopia with Catholic Relief Services. This experience could be five times more powerful in our sphere of ministry because there were five of us that went. And, and not only our own experiences in, in the five different parishes that we work, but beginning to have conversations with, with higher ed institutions in the diocese in order to imagine what it might be like. A colleague is on the call or on the, the, the session today with us, Marie Kenyon from the Archdiocese of St. Louis, who sits on the board at Enquentro Project. Huge, huge thank you of hospitality for Father Rafael Garcia, Coralise Salvador, Debbie Northern, and Brother Todd Patinode. Incredible hospitality. Oh, the ability to make sense of, of having that type of an immersion experience, which is accessible to folks. And one of the things they do at the end of the time is they have a picture of you, and then they allow you to write your name artistically on the frame around it, and they put up. And you can put it up on the wall so you can see who else has been there. The projects like Enquentro Project that are accessible for folks, we need to take advantage of those. And for those of us that have been so uh, graced to have had the experience to bring that energy back. One of the things that, that I took away from this, and I, I, I keep it in my Liturgy of the Hours book, is all liturgy is done by the power of the Holy Spirit. For us, that experience down there was bookended. We like jump out of the van at, at a few minutes before sunrise at, um, at a national park, White Sands National Monument. And we're like, we're going up on the, we're going up on the, the, the dunes. And so everybody's traipsing along and, and we're watching, we're, we're praying as the sun is rising. And I think that that was a beautiful launch for what we then in turn did. And at the tail end of it was the border at the mass. So for me, it was uh, an incredibly powerful experience. And ultimately, the, the power of the Holy Spirit was very present. And I have a responsibility to have that same uh, presence in, in everything that we do 
here in our 22 counties, because there's a whole lot of ministering that needs to be done, though I will say there's a whole lot that is already being undertaken. We just got to we just got to have those those many immersion experiences in different locations across the diocese. This is a, a great opportunity to throw out a little commercial for World Relief, which is an organization that we've been working with at St. Paul's. We've uh, kind of adopted a couple families, helped them resettle in the area. And World Relief is the agency here in the Quad Cities that is officially connected with the federal government to receive some of the funds that goes towards uh, resettling refugees. That's the really short answer. But um, just this week, uh, an opportunity, um, Laura Fontaine from World Relief reached out and we have two families of nine Afghan refugees that are moving to the Quad Cities and uh, they're having trouble finding properties for these larger families. They found a duplex in Rock Island that had room for uh, two families of nine. They asked us to uh, see if we could get people together to outfit these houses. Number one, to get them all the furniture and the stuff that they need, but also see if there were some folks that wanted to come in and kind of HGTV them up, you know, to, to really get them looking nice and everything. And so uh, at St. Paul's, we, we said, yeah, we do this. And, and also uh, working with uh, Deacon Steve Barton at Holy Family. And I think St. Al's might be jumping into, certainly it's open to anybody that wants to help. Um, but we are trying to, I guess, short thing, the, the first family then, we, they got the phone call that they're showing up today. So World Relief went and knocked out the first duplex. The second one, we are, we're gathering things. And I'm going to put a link in the, in the chat where you can go to a sign-up genius. And you can say, I'll donate these specific things that they need so we don't have duplicate and that kind of thing. And then you can drop those off at one of those parishes. Or if your parish wants to get involved, you give me a call. I'll put my email in there too, or it's on the sign of genius actually. Um, and then uh, on the 14th, we're going to take all that stuff over. We're going to we're going to set up this duplex for this family of nine that's uh, that's coming to the area. So it's uh, you don't you won't have a chance to meet them specifically, but you'll have a chance to make a huge difference in some people's lives and make them feel uh, welcome in our community. So, hey Brian, yeah, can we uh, cover that as a story? That's excellent. That's awesome. What a great Christmas story. As long as you put someone else's face on the front of the messenger, I've <laughs> met my quota for the year. The other thing I'll I'm add. I'm just going to go, go back to the question about so what. I mean, that's, Ryan, I think that's a good example of so what. I was just thinking about that. And back to your comment about uh, every diocese is a border diocese. I mean, right, right here, we, we have opportunities like that right in front of us and many more. The other thing I will add is, uh, you know, Bishop Sites is, all, they're also doing refugee resettlement in El Paso of Afghan refugees. And in my little chancery staff mind, I'm going, how are you, what? Seriously? He goes, oh yeah. So, I mean, the other part to it is World Relief is doing the, the frontline response. And and what we do is we don't get so overly concerned about turf and just say, oh, no, you know, parish one, two, three have the means of supporting that larger effort. There's there's so much work to be done. We just have to be good neighbors in in seeing what's available in our in our particular community outside of the, the parish walls. I want to make a plug for the Catholic Messenger, too, because we're going to be doing more stories. Just wanted to let you know on, on some of the border immersion experience. And um, after we finish today, um, I will be sending out in sometime in the next few days um, the video, a link to the video, and then also um, in contact information for presenters if they provide it, and then links to things that we've discussed or have, have come up. Um, like Ryan's uh, information about world, world relief and then links to the messenger articles. And I would say, always make sure, don't just check the front page, always check Barb's own personal column and also check the opinion page. Um, and you'll find a lot of relevant information there. Um, I'm hopeful that when um, Kent was speaking that I managed to get a couple of pictures up. Did those show for everybody? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Barb had very graciously provided some photos for me and I have totally forgotten to play those for everybody. Um, 
But while we're in our final minutes, I will put those up. So if there are other questions, um, please feel free to ask those of our presenters or if presenters, if you have something else you wanna share, please feel free to. No questions. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and put those uh, photos up really quick. And then um, also wanted to let everybody know that um, there, we're going to take a break in January from the lunch and learns, and um, but we will be coming back in February. Then, um, first Thursday of February, we will have another one. Um, would anybody care to share what this particular photo was about? This is um, Bishop Stinkula talking with the Bishop of um, Ciudad Juarez. Great, um, Bishop Torres Campos of Ciudad Juarez. Yes. Great. And actually, you have uh, Father Raphael there in the in the foreground on that picture. So and there's Ken, there's Ken Ferris by the fence taking a picture of the. Oh, is that me, the one that took the picture? Anyway, it's it's Bishop talk, talking to um, both Brother Todd and and Debbie that we referenced from Encuentro Project. It's we're on the the Mexican side of the fence. Mass at the border. And this was the mass barb that you referenced to the, um, they bring up the crosses with the names of people who have died. Is yeah. that correct? Yep. Okay. Father Raphael uh, talking about the history of El Paso by way of a mural at a uh, downtown parish that he is both, he's pastor there as well as being um, involved in the Encuentro project. And you, well, if you flip back for us one second, Amy, Notice um, Our Lady of Guadalupe handing a, uh, a towel uh, to, I mean, you can't see it, but there's a, it's a slightly different image of Our Lady of Guadalupe uh, ministering in that moment. Sister Betty Campbell, 87 year old religious sister, originally from Davenport. Uh, I met her two years ago. She said, please come back. And, and we did. And we brought the bishop and, and she referred to him as Bishop Tom. And they had a great conversation and um, amazing, um, am amazing woman and one of the women religious amongst many that I consider as my teachers. Mass at Encuentro Project. Again, uh, to my immediate right is uh, Father Raphael. To my immediate left is Debbie. The delegation. Yeah. Well, again, uh, we have about a minute left. I, I want to thank each of you um, for coming and speaking with us, Ryan and Gary and Barb and Kent, um, and sharing your experience. I think, I think you've done a great job of. Um, convincing all of us that it's very important that we, we make the effort to get to know other people, to truly be present with them and listen to them and hear their stories. So thank you again for that. And thank you to everybody else for being with us today. Be watching for that email. And if you have any um, questions, you can absolutely reach out to me and I'll try and answer them. And if not, I'll forward them on to the person who can. So thank you all. Um, enjoy the rest of your day.